Hello, and welcome to our third installment uh, by Hub International, Beyond COVID-19, Vaccines in the Workplace. My name is Scott Fouts. I'm the Senior Vice President and Risk Services Leader for Hub International. Hub International is the world's fourth largest insurance brokerage firm and a leading provider in business and personal insurance, employee benefits, retirement, and risk services consulting. We are recording this program today, and it will be available on demand after viewing the webinar today. You'll receive a link to listen. Feel free to view it again or actually share it with your colleagues. So as we're starting to get this panel together today to kind of review kind of COVID kind of deployment across the country uh, from a vaccination program standpoint, uh, there's a lot of um, misconceptions on programs and things that are going to be required. Uh, in this third installment of the webinar series, uh, we're going to talk about kind of best practices for organizations that are looking to implement the policy, uh, but also maybe best practices that are already out there that other organizations are already doing. So today on the panel, we actually have Hub's very own Carrie Shavini. Carrie, welcome. Thanks. Carrie is our Senior Vice President and Strategic Risk Solutions uh, and Compliance Officer for Hub International. Uh, she has over 20 years experience in employment law, uh, litigation, HR. Uh, she is literally the guru that's been carrying a lot of our conversations, uh, all things related to COVID-19, the pandemic, and a vaccination policy. And then we also have our partners uh, with Fisher Phillips, uh, Marty Heller and Travis Vance. Uh, Fisher Phillips is one of the largest U.S. law firms uh, representing management uh, exclusively in labor, employment law, uh, civil rights, employee benefits, and immigration law. They have about 33 offices uh, across the country and over 400 attorneys. So welcome, uh, Marty. Marty is a member of the firm's COVID-19 task force. Cross-disciplinary teams uh, kind of dedicated to advising employers uh, kind of across the workplace and all aspects of global for uh, this global pandemic coronavirus. Uh, he also brings together a combination of litigation abilities, dedicated compliance knowledge to try to solve your wage and hour problems uh, before the, the media and your companies hit that bottom line. And then next we have Travis Vance. Uh, he's also a partner. Uh, Travis is a member of the COVID-19 task force uh, there at Fisher Phillips. And also, he has received over 60 requests uh, to speak to topics concerning the pandemic. And we can definitely appreciate the time to speak today because we know he's, uh, he's been a busy man getting around to a lot of uh, different clients of theirs. And he'll be speaking to some of the uh, information that they have from their firm. So uh, welcome, everyone. I really appreciate your time. Uh, so I guess maybe we'll start with Carrie first. Uh, I always like to come out of the gate with, uh, with kind of the person that's been leading the charge with, with our hub teams. Uh, Carrie, when you think about the rollout process, you know, really just in the U.S., when you think about across our footprint right now, what should employers be focused on? What areas do you think should be kind of front and center as they're thinking about rolling out a vaccination process? And then, Marty, I may tip it to you after that, just to ask you specifically vaccinations in the workplace. You know, what are you seeing, you know, kind of across the U.S. that organizations can be doing to support their overall operational efforts? Carrie? Um, thanks, Scott. So there's a lot of things to consider at this time. And I think if you're going to try to nutshell where we are and what employers are grappling with, it really comes down to, and you guys have probably heard me say this before, mandate, motivate, or educate. And that's kind of the going theme, you know, which bucket do you fall in as an employer and determining where you land is really contingent to some extent on a lot of external factors like industry standards, industry requirements, state and local laws. So there's a lot to consider. There's a lot of moving parts. I know that Marty's been deep diving in this as well. So I, I'd love to hear from him on this topic too. Sure, thanks Gary. So I think the, the motivate and educate piece is the one that, that we're working on the most right now. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, later about mandatory vaccines and whether that's a good idea and, and why or why not. But I think right now, from most employers' perspectives, look, we're looking at a system where most employers, their employees can't get vaccines right now. Uh, certainly healthcare industry, you can. And certainly if you're senior care, uh, you can. And in some states, there are other options, especially with teachers. But what you can be doing right now, you know, look, if you say most employers don't have access to this at the moment and don't have the ability to mandate as of today or as of tomorrow, you can be educating right now and you can have your plans and policies in place to be effective. So to your point about kind of deciding what road you want to take, 
this is the time to be putting together your teams on this. So if you haven't already, you really should be looking at who should be our decision makers as far as what direction the company wants to go. And out of that, whether you should have an HR team member, probably somebody in operations and management, probably somebody who boots to the pavement, who can speak effectively uh, to your hourly workforce and have different members of the team in the same room talking about the same issues so that there's buy-in from everyone about what type of plan are we going to roll out? Uh, is it going to be mandatory? Uh, is it going to be uh, recommended? And however you're going to do it, what is the policy actually going to look like? This is the time to be rolling out that policy right now. Marty, that's really good information. Uh, when you're thinking about kind of implementing a plan or even developing or thinking about it, are there specific kind of legal considerations that uh, employers or HR or organizations should be thinking about as they're moving forward into maybe 2021 and beyond? Sure. And so, you know, before we even go into the specific laws, I think the most important thing to remember is how fast this is changing. Um, Travis is a brilliant OSHA mind uh, around these parts in the in the Fisher Phillips buildings, and I can't even imagine how much is changing in the OSHA world day to day with all the CDC guidance. In my world, uh, EEOC and FLSA, uh, you know, Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, EEOC, uh, Department of Labor considerations are so rapidly changing. If you think about the fact that we were looking at guidance. Uh, that was provided by the EEOC in December. And of course, that's prior administration. Well, what's happened since then? Well, we had a new administration sworn in. We don't actually have, but we know we're soon to have a new head of the Department of Labor. We are new nation, uh, new majority in the National Labor Relations Board, new majority on the EEOC's board, new GC for the National Labor Relations Board. These are all things that are rapidly changing. And so insights we had two months ago are changing so fast that all we can do is tell you expect the unexpected. And when I talked about having a team in place, you really should have somebody on that team whose sole job it is, is to keep up with these changes. Um, you know, follow Hubs alerts, follow Fisher Phillips alerts, whatever your preferred alert site is, but pay a lot of attention to this. Uh, you know, we're not going to talk too much about uh, what a lot of the first two webinars focused on that have put together on vaccines. But, you know, keep in mind, whether you can make it mandatory or not, the reality is there's no such thing as mandatory because the ADA trumps that. And, and you're going to have people saying, I can't take this vaccine because of my health or I can't take this vaccine because of my religion or insert reason but you might have a legal obligation to accommodate them. And even more so, if you wanna actually enforce your policy, so we can say we've got a mandatory vaccine policy, but if you wanna enforce it and say, you can't come into the workplace unless you've had the vaccine, you're gonna to have to either say that the person poses a direct threat to the others and either themselves or others in the workplace, or you're gonna to have to show it's a qualification standard. And historically, that's been public safety issues and issues related to safety in the healthcare industry. So I think it's just something you really got to realize that the EEOC guidance that was in place from December is likely to be updated very soon. We saw in January issuance of wellness programs, guidance that's already been um, rescinded and likely to be changed soon. Uh, and I know Carrie and I were talking the other day about how you know, this could literally be tomorrow, uh, and we're all on our toes uh, all the time. Well, that's really good information. So, uh, so real quick, I'll back up, and you touched on two points there that I thought would be important for um, anybody that's doing this. You know, there's a lot of um, legal considerations that are up there, and, and, and Carrie or Marty can kind of speak to this, but um, I guess my kind of follow-up question would be like, you know, would there be HR involved, CFO? Like, would, would, does it make sense to have a steering committee as a lot of companies are moving towards that? It's tough to have things just falling, you know, HR. I think that would be something that 
needed or something that I think, you know, kind of futuristically going forward that steering committee will actually support all the operational efforts from, you know, workplace safety, which we'll touch on in a little bit, but also kind of that rollout of the vaccination program. So are, what other people should be involved as if they were going to develop a little bit of a steering committee outside of maybe HR or the CFO, something like that? Carrie? Okay. Yeah, I've got it. So it really depends on your organizational structure and it depends on who has the authority for enforcement. I think one of the biggest gaps that I've seen, and I know Travis will touch on this as well, is the enforcement of these safety policies and safety protocols. So having that steering committee or having that team come together, ensuring that it's multidisciplinary will help ensure that whatever approach you take as an employer, there's oversight, there's enforcement, there's consistency, there's some kind of guardrails and rules around that approach that will be, you'll get the buy-in across the organization, you'll get the enforcement across the organization. If you operate in a silo and in HR is out there on their own as they often are trying to carry that big stick, if you will, um, trying to ensure that they get buy-in and they have guardrails and they have consistency, consistency in following whatever approach the employer takes, well, that's an awful lot of, that's an awfully big ask for human resources. So you really need folks that are in operations, maybe if you're in manufacturing and you have somebody in charge of floor operations, if you're in a call center and you have a call center supervisor or manager who oversees the entirety of the operations of the facility, those folks are gonna be really important. Um, and then maybe you wanna have some rank and file employees, one or two, be part of that committee, be part of the programming, because getting buy-in across the organization is certainly gonna help ensure success. Awesome, and I would thanks, Gary. And I would just add real quickly, I agree with Carrie. This uh, disciplinary or enforcement actions are very important. Remember, just because you're in a pandemic doesn't mean you can't enforce safety rules. So if you have a work rule, it's communicated to your employees, you certainly can discipline your employees who fail to uh, to cooperate or follow the rule. And it, it promotes employee morale. If if someone else is getting away with it and you, they're not disciplined for it, then people are not going to like that. And to Carrie's point, it's, it's crucial that you have the hourly workers involved in this process from the very beginning. The more input they can have, you can engage them because an educated worker is gonna be a worker that's not scared, that's not afraid of coming for, to work. So I highly encourage that uh, the folks on the call uh, get hourly workers involved um, in your COVID-19 protocols from the very beginning. Thank you. Um, are there other legal, I guess you know, Marty, I'll, I'll ask kind of follow up, are there other legal considerations, you know, kind of positioning organizations to kind of move forward again, not into this year, but you know, as we go forward into, you know, any futuristic type of opportunities uh, for vaccination programs. Um, are there any other legal considerations uh, from your viewpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole cycle of considerations that folks need to be looking at. And I think it starts with knowing your workforce and are you a multi-state employer? Um, because I think for a lot of folks who are employers all over the country, uh, they're already familiar with the fact that what's going on in California is not going to be consistent with what's going on in Georgia, uh, which is not going to be consistent with what's going on in Michigan. And so we're seeing all these different states kind of pop out with their own rules. Um, you know, and Travis could speak to Cal OSHA and, and, and how aggressive they've been. Um, and I, I really do think that to the extent that we are sitting and waiting on uh, a federal guideline, uh, whether it be on COVID or uh, on vaccines or anything uh, related to the current pandemic, uh, I think we're going to see states act faster and faster. It's the same thing we've seen in the wage and hour atmosphere when we've seen people waiting on the increase in minimum wage. Uh, and what do states do if they don't like how long it's taking? They act faster than that because federal law sets the floor, not the ceiling. So I think state and local laws is where you have to start with that. And I think understanding the priorities that states have placed on vaccines. So, you know, for example, if you want to have a mandatory policy, uh, how are you going to be able to enforce that and when? Um, because certainly you might be in a situation where, you know, you might want to say, well, we expect that all of our employees will have their second round of the vaccine by the end of July. 
Well, depends what states they're in and what priority priorities that state has placed on the vaccines, you might not be able to enforce that policy. So you have to be nimble uh, and you have to be capable of understanding the change. Uh, one thing I think is really important to not forget about is the National Labor Relations Act uh, and the potential impact you might have. Are, I'm not a labor lawyer. I, I don't even pretend to understand all the uh, requirements uh, under collective bargaining agreements and mandatory negotiations and what does and does not have to be bargained for. Uh, but we are on the cusp of a lot of unionized employers having to grapple with these issues. And I think that's a really important one, especially when you're dealing with employees who want to speak together to make a point about whether or not they do or do not want to get the vaccine because that immediately screams Section 7 rights under the National Labor Relations Act uh, with what's called concerted protected activity and making sure that as an employer, you are very comfortable with, and, and to your point, Scott, about uh, having multiple team members, having somebody from your labor team on the, uh, on the vaccine team is very important. Yeah, and, and yeah, to no, Marty's point, I want to jump in on that. When you look at your write-ups and your programming and your approach to communication, you've got to be clear, you've got to be careful that you're not infringing on the employee's rights and ability to talk about their opinion and their perspective on your vaccine program and approach. And they, their ability and their rights to speak freely um, is is becoming more broad, not less, as we see the changes that Marty referenced in the National Labor Relations Board and the representation on the board and, and changing and the changes in leadership in the DOL and other places. And so if an employee wants to speak out and talk about their fear about coming to work or their opinion on the safety program or their opinion regarding the employer's approach to the vaccine, they are free to do so. And those rights will continue to be broadened, not narrowed as we see changes in leadership and approach to employment and Section 7 rights. The other thing I want to add in as I was thinking and listening to our conversation today is a reminder that there's so much that's happening right now that's unprecedented. Where do we even begin when it comes to identifying how unprecedented this world has become? And I'm really tired of that word, right? Because it's the best word there is. Um, but we are operating under vaccine protocols that are approved only for emergency use authorization. There's a whole history of vaccines in our country and mandatory vaccines. Mandatory vaccines go back to the early 1800s when Massachusetts was the first state to ever implement mandatory vaccines. 1855, we see Boston implementing mandatory vaccines for school children. So the concept isn't foreign. You know, and in the 1950s and 60s, we see the polio vaccine become predominantly used across the United States and across the world. What we haven't seen is reliance on a vaccine that's under emergency use authorization. And I think that's tripping people up. That's creating fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And from a legal testing perspective, if you will, we don't know if the courts would find that to be something that would distinguish the employer's right or ability to mandate or even motivate and incentivize the vaccine versus other vaccines such as flu vaccines or hep B or other um, vaccines that we see, tuberculosis in the medical industry in particular. So when we talk about building out a vaccine program, I know we're here to help you guys build out a program, but you've got to also know what's unknown because to Marty's very good point, you got to be nimble. You got to be able to be flexible and you got to be able to respond as some of these questions are answered. Yeah, and Carrie, you brought up a good point about, you know, obviously knowing what employees are looking for and employers are looking for out of their program and having kind of a little bit of a, a communication process. Um, I know, uh, Marty, I'll turn it back over to you. I know you all had provided uh, kind of your own survey to gather some of this data, um, you know, on opinions because there's a lot of misinformation out there on the internet and different news channels and things like that. But I think you all did your own survey. So um, any areas that you want to speak to or results from that standpoint that kind of tease up some of the things that Carrie just touched on? Yeah. And so I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, we, we surveyed over 600 of our clients through what we call a flash survey. 
uh, asking for very timely responses. And uh, to get an idea of how many of our clients are intending to make this vaccine, uh, their vaccine policies mandatory, what types of incentives are people looking at doing? Um, and the results, at least to me, were pretty surprising. Um, you know, almost 65% of the individuals we surveyed said they have no interest in making it mandatory. And, uh, you know, another 27% said that they're not sure. So if you just look at the math there, less than 10% of people actually, less than 10% of our clients had interest in uh, considering whether to make it a mandatory uh, vaccine policy or not. Uh, on the other hand, more than 80% were interested in putting together plans that strongly encouraged it and considering whether or not they can and how to incentivize uh, clients, or, sorry, employees with uh, taking the vaccine, how to get the vaccine. Um, you know, we had somewhere around 75% were either wanting to do an incentive or were unsure if they wanted to do an incentive. What I think is really interesting, and, and Carrie and I were having a discussion about this uh, probably three weeks ago that we still don't know the answer to right now, is what kind of incentives can you offer? Um, and what kind of incentives do you want to offer? Um, and the guidance that was rescinded uh, let us know that you, know, you really need to be looking at the de minimis principle for the most part if it's gonna be viewed as a wellness program. Um, and there's some ways to try and get around it. Um, and there's some ways to try to avoid the application of the wellness program rules, particularly if it's not mandatory and if the individuals are sent to get the vaccine anywhere they'd like uh, and not through someone that you contract with. I think you got a pretty good argument that there's no way you could be coercing medical information and therefore the wellness program rules shouldn't apply. Having said that, uh, we now, and uh, there was a great article yesterday uh, that came up in CNN, uh, and I won't mention the employers, but it did a great survey of employers uh, as to what incentives are currently being offered. And the highest incentive I saw was $125. Uh, and it goes down from there. The vast majority of employers seem to be offering two hours per shop or four hours total in PTO. Uh, and one thing, and, and Carrie, I'm curious to, to see your opinion on this, and Travis, you as well. Uh, but, you know, brought up in my mind was, well, what do you do if, if you're offering PTO, but then somebody has a reaction? Uh, and the next day, they feel like they can't go to work. And do we take away from the PTO bank the next day? And a lot of the plans I've seen initially on early rollout weren't dealing with that. But I think it's something we need to start dealing with right now. Because if somebody gets two hours of PTO to go take the shot and then they have flu-like symptoms the next day, we certainly don't want to be punishing them. Uh, but I don't know the best way to do that. I'm curious your opinion, Carrie. So I've seen a few programs where employers have said if you have uh, medical complications or symptoms from the vaccine and you're unable to come to work, we will pay you and not take it out of your PTO or sick time bank. But to your point, I've only seen about 25% of the programs that I've read about um, offer that kind of additional benefit. It's interesting as well because the CDC has really beefed up to their guidance and they have a really nice chart that delineates between side effects from the vaccine and symptoms of COVID-19. And I've been, I have a, a personal case, my cousin um, is a New York City police officer and he got the vaccine but then came down with severe symptoms to the extent that it was much more likely that he actually got COVID. And so also being able to determine, is this COVID? And do we need to engage our COVID response plan or COVID safety plan? Because this person more than likely has COVID, not merely side effects from the vaccine. So communication becomes really important there as well. Yeah, and from an OSHA standpoint, uh, in the historically OSHA has said if you have side effects from a vaccine, you actually have to record that on your OSHA 300 log if you miss days away or receive medical treatment above and beyond first aid. I haven't seen guidance from OSHA on that for the COVID-19 vaccine, but that's an interesting development too, 
then of course, if um, we need more guidance from the, the CDC or, or OSHA that if you have these side effects, are you a potential hazard to others in the workplace, which would require uh, the employee to be removed from the workplace. So that's an interesting development. I think we'll be, be seeing more of that. Thank you. Um, so Carrie, kind of tacking on to what you were just talking about and Marty, feel free to, to kind of speak to it also. When you think about kind of the, the latest vaccine, kind of timing, the updates, um, kind of a holistic approach of kind of that rollout, anything you can speak to uh, from your standpoint on those timing and the updates uh, that you've seen so far uh, that's been rolled out? Yeah, I, I think Marty made a really great point about what you can be doing now and that planning and communication phase is huge. The CDC, OSHA, um, even Joint Commission for the healthcare folks on the phone today, there's some terrific education and communication materials out there. The practical reality is just like Marty said before, you can't mandate now anyway. You can't really mandate because of the accommodations that you have to provide. But unless you're a healthcare provider, the vaccine's not widely available. So how do you take advantage of this time? Um, and the planning is a huge part of it, communicating and educating your employees. And people are, are really concerned and are, it's a very polarizing topic. People have sort of picked their camp and they're sticking their stake in their ground and hanging on tight. And so the more you can educate employees, help them make their own decisions, the um, desire to reach herd immunity and vaccinate your workforce may solve itself as people make their own free choices, then you don't have culture issues, you don't have compliance issues, you don't have recruiting and retention issues um, around your vaccination approach or protocol. If you let employees learn, overcome their fears and hesitancy themselves and make their own choices. We do certainly expect to see the J&J &J vaccine approved, hopefully in the next week or two, and that will give employees yet another avenue and another type of vaccine for those who are afraid of the um, current Pfizer and Moderna approach, the J&J &J is a different kind of vaccine, and they may be more amenable to that vaccine versus the others. So getting the information out about the differences in the vaccines and the choices that they have may also result in more successful vaccinations in your workplace. Yeah, and you make a good point, Carrie. I mean, uh, there's so many varying ideas around getting a vaccine, even amongst our friends this weekend. Uh, you know, we were talking about the different, you know, Pfizer versus Moderna, um, you know, who's going to get what and when it may roll out. And, and still, uh, even with, amongst, you know, our close friends, we had um, people that were telling us they, they'll probably wait or, you know, they're not going to be required or they can work from home. Um, so obviously there are some organizations out there making considerations for those folks, especially being able to work remote. Um, Marty, your thoughts on kind of the timeline or maybe considerations, you know, as we go forward, especially um, as it pertains to maybe the Department of Labor or EOC or, or OSHA, any thoughts around that uh, from your standpoint? Yeah, I think it's kind of impending. Um, you know, I think the EEOC guidance is, is it, I would be very surprised if it takes more than a month from today for us to get additional guidance from the EEOC, both on furthering their view on employer policies on vaccines, as well as uh, most importantly for what was rescinded, understanding um, the wellness principles and, and incentive payments and what exactly does de minimis mean and are they going to enforce that? in this context, uh, which I think there are ways that they could essentially exempt this context from the wellness program rules uh, fairly easily. And it's a real question of, is, is that going to be a step that the EEOC, at least today's EEOC is going to take? Uh, as far as the vaccine rollout, and I feel like, I think it's interesting. I feel like we see new data on this almost daily uh, where, you know, initially we were really hopeful that maybe uh, based on remarks from Dr. Fauci that we might be looking at late March. Um, and it looks like they pushed that out later for when the vaccine may be widely available. Um, you know, part of this is state by state, how well are they actually rolling out the vaccine and how, how easily can people access it that are currently in the priority grouping uh, but I think what we're looking at is hopefully by April or May, we'll all have the decision of which one to get, you know, to Carrie's point. 
of being educated on the different uh, vaccines. I think one thing that's really important uh, is that the information we provide to our, to the employees isn't from Johnson and Johnson and isn't from Pfizer. Uh, I think there's a wide uh, belief that they're being fed information they may not believe, but instead, you know, I think a great idea uh, that I, I have a client that's been doing is bringing in local health professionals to speak mm -hmm. about what they're seeing in their practice and the benefits of potential vaccination when it becomes available. And it's done as kind of town hall meetings. Uh, and they're not done to give specific medical advice or advice of any type, but just to talk about the vaccines and what they're seeing in their practice. And it's one one area where I think you know, there's a there's a ton of room to educate with widely available information from the CDC, from state and federal governments. And I think staying with something that is less controversial is going to result in more of your employees trusting the information you're giving. Because the latest survey results we've seen from a national scale are that some are scary, that up to 50 percent of people don't want to get the vaccine. And certainly we hope there's there's all kinds of different survey results. I've seen some in the more like 15 to 20% don't want to get it. Um, but the best thing you can do is educate your employees so that they, they, they will get it when it becomes available. Thank you. Um, so I'll switch gears a little bit. Um, Carrie, maybe back over to you. Heard a lot about um, you know what we should be looking for. Maybe take us through kind of that program design considerations, and, and Marty, feel free to uh, for you and Carrie to kind of go back and forth here. But when you're thinking about mandatory programs, uh, and I, I use that term loosely, uh, but those design considerations for uh, employers and employees, uh, Carrie, your thoughts on that, and then we'll work our way to you know back through the incentive programs and kind of the design layout. But want to get your thoughts on that first. So a couple practical realities to a mandatory program. We've already talked about the fact that the vaccine's not widely available, and even a mandatory program has exceptions to it under federal and state law. The other practical reality is that in the past, we've seen successful employment-based mandatory or highly incentivized programs because vendors came on site. There was a convenience factor to it. Um, there was a, I see 10 other people in line to get the vaccine, maybe I'm not quite as afraid of the vaccine as I was before, right? You see all, all the cool kids are doing it kind of concept. We're not going to see on-site vaccines for the COVID vaccine, likely this year at all. The vendors that we have spoken to in the vaccination space have told us that they may make an exception if they have enough supply of the vaccine later in the year for single site employers with a thousand or more employees. And the reason we talk to these vendors, of course, is because Hub is so involved in building out wellness programs and bringing on the vendors who provide the flu vaccine and the biometric testing and the annual wellness programs and the annual health fairs. There's no similarity whatsoever to the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine. So maybe someday, you'll have your wellness fair and your employee will go get the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine. Maybe it'll even be one vaccine all at once. But the reality is that's not where we are today and it likely is not gonna be where we are throughout the rest of the year. We've talked a lot about the rules. We've got webinars on the rules. Fisher Phillips has awesome articles and webinars on the rules. So I wanna talk about another practical reality, which is your culture. What does recruitment look like? I don't know about you, Marty, but the clients I've been talking to are dying on the vine for talent right now in every industry. In the beginning, it was certainly in hospitality and maybe even healthcare a little bit. But today I've talked to coding companies, tech companies, um, white collar call centers, everyone I talk to, retail and restaurants and hotels, you name it, and they're dying for talent. Will a mandatory vaccine program create a hurdle to recruitment? Will you have a difficult time recruiting your talent? Will you have difficulty retaining talent? The, pra the practical reality is when we talk about multidisciplinary task force or teams to come up with your approach to vaccines and safety in the workplace, that means you better be prepared to enforce this. So are you ready to fire somebody because they didn't get the vaccine and don't have a legal exemption or exception to a vaccine program? So as you think about what comes next for your organization, You've got to have those operational folks involved in those discussions because they know better than 
you know, a lot, not most, but a lot around the challenges with recruiting and retention and the culture and the appetite the employees would have for a mandatory vaccination program. Marty, what am I missing? No, I, I think that's right on. And candidly, when I get a phone call from a client uh, that wants to consider a mandatory program, my current viewpoint is I'm going to talk them out of it. Um, and it's not that there aren't ways to do it and that there aren't ways to do it right, but it's fraught with risk right now. And, you know, I'm a risk averse kind of lawyer. And my goal is to make sure I put my clients out of harm's way. And right now, I think there's just not a great way to do that with a mandatory program with what we're looking at right now. It doesn't mean we can't build a good one. And it doesn't mean that you won't have a fully enforceable mandatory program. Uh, but, it, you know, it's like uh, anybody who, who likes to play uh, on the higher risk side of anything, it doesn't take being wrong. It just takes someone suing you for it, uh, that you have to defend it. And the closer you get on the risk standpoint, the more likely you are that someone is going to challenge you on it. And you have to be ready to defend that. And that's a, that's a big ask for a lot of employers right now. To your point, Carrie, uh, if you're trying to keep employee morale up and you're also taking this high risk, what I think is high risk, sometimes low reward approach of being on the riskier side and saying you must get a vaccine to in order to continue working here. I think you're, you're putting yourself in a position where it's going to be very, very hard to keep your best performing employees happy. Thank you, Marty. Appreciate that information. Um, Carrie, kind of moving that forward into kind of that program design consideration, um, you touched on incentive programs a little bit earlier. Um, maybe kind of speak to what those incentive programs maybe look and feel like, and then um, I'll circle back with Marty to kind of maybe take us through a little bit of a metrics there on what considerations uh, we should be looking at as far as the program. So Marty did a great job of touching on the number one gray area. I'm not sure if there's a better color than gray, but it's just such a vague area right now with respect to whether or not you can incentivize, if you can incentivize, how much of an incentive is allowable, how much is not. One of the things that we've said to clients who are pretty committed to an incentive program and some committed to big incentive programs is do yourself a favor and do your best to insulate your program from your health and wellness program and from your health insurance. Don't take carrier credits toward the cost of the vaccine. Don't build it into your annual biometric, your annual wellness program. Really talk to folks like Travis and Scott about how to tie your vaccination program into your health and safety program. I can't guarantee you that the EEOC is going to bless this and find it to be acceptable, but we do know that the EEOC incentive rules are tied to the group health plan and group health and wellness programming. So the more you can separate that incentive, the more chance you might have, and I cringe when I even say chance, um, to be able to defend it as an acceptable incentive program. And you may say, well, we see all these programs out there. They're making the news like crazy. We know that, but we can't tell you that they would be deemed acceptable by the EEOC because we just don't know. The Chamber of Commerce wrote the EEOC a pretty sternly worded letter. And Marty, I don't remember how many organizations signed off. It was north of 40 or 50, if I remember correctly, um, virtually demanding that the EEOC issue its position and guidance on employer incentives and vaccines. So again, Scott, you, know, you asked such a good question before about timing. This is the time to think about the approach. You've got some runway here. Wait till the EEOC comes out with its guidance and then build a program that you know would be allowable and acceptable. Uh, that, that is great information. So I, I, I'll push pause on that. So uh, Marty spoke to you know, a couple of things that I've been taking some notes here. And, and this is for the kind of the round table of the group, maybe even kick it over to Travis here real quick. When you think about maybe looking at that and developing a program, would it make sense to survey your own employees from an organizational standpoint to see how palatable an incentive program would be or where the feelings are on that, that side of it? Or to Marty's point, does it make sense to put together a town hall and have kind of a health or benefits expert speak to and educate uh, not just the organization, but, you know, 
the HR team, the employees to make sure it's all one message. Um, thoughts on kind of developing that approach as someone, to Carrie's point, right now is the time to be thinking about whether they want to do it or not. Would that be a good starting point, do you think, Travis? And then, like I said, Marty, Carrie, if you all want to jump in. Yeah, I think there's two questions there, Scott. I think they're both really good questions. One, on the town hall education piece, we see a lot of clients, that, especially when there's a minority population, they have a demographic issue where the people that are in management are not uh, of the same demographic as the employees, and they're not going to necessarily listen to them about, you know, whether or not they've taken the vaccine or whether they think it's uh, safe or not. So they they will do an employee video, which which has employees that look like them talking about you know, that they took the vaccine, it was safe, they didn't have any problems with it. We've seen that to be very effective and move the needle by eight to 10 percentage points over a weekend as to how many employees are comfortable taking the vaccine. And to your second point, I think the survey is a great idea. You should be doing that, not just on incentives, but also who will actually take the vaccine or who, who, who may take the vaccine. Because what we found is one of the biggest struggles for employers going back to Carrie and Marty's points is how do I get my employees, if they're eligible for vaccines, uh, to a health clinic? How do they get to the top of the line to be eligible next for the vaccine? So if you do the survey, what we found to be very effective, you send a letter to the health department that says, here, we're ready to go. We're an essential business. We qualify for vaccines. And then you follow up a couple of days later and say, by the way, here's 50 employees that we have ready to go for you to vaccinate. And the health departments love that because they like to knock out a a big chunk of employees at the same time. It helps them, and that's been very effective in addition to that education campaign. Awesome. Um, Marty Carey, anything to add on there? Uh, Travis, thank you. That's uh, obviously aligned with some of the messaging we've had with some of our clients, uh, but great insight there. Marty Carey, uh, before we kind of move forward off uh, of antenna programs, any thoughts uh, to tackle on the Travis's comment? Uh, just just one thing I think it's important for employers to remember is when we talk about incentives tied to vaccines, we're often also talking about the ADA and accommodations uh, under both ADA and Title VII for religious reasons. There needs to be an alternative way to earn the incentive. And I think that's one thing employers don't really think about, but it's not an incentive for getting the vaccine. It's an incentive for getting the vaccine or if there is a basis upon which you are not able to, or it's not safe for you to get the vaccine, or it's contrary to your religious beliefs, there are alternative ways. And I think understanding the role that education plays in that component so that you can really build the alternative method, which is, you know, I'm gonna educate you on all the benefits and, and some of the continuing risks and, and understanding safety in the workplace. And, and you can still get the incentive even if you don't get the vaccine. I think it's really important to make sure you're doing that because otherwise you could be starting off with an assumption uh, that your incentive plan provides something that it can't provide legally. Absolutely. Uh, Carrie, any thoughts? I'm sorry, shaking your head a little bit kind of through both, but any comments or follow-ups? Yeah, it's such a good point, Marty. I'm so glad that you just said that. And then there's a whole other population that sort of falls into this gap, right? As as far as I've most recently read, the CDC still has not indicated that the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine have been approved for pregnant women, right? So you certainly can't force pregnant women to get the vaccine. And if you build an incentive program, could you arguably leave them out because they're pregnant, even though they're not disabled or have a religious exemption? My answer would be, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> I think that's a really bad idea. And I think it would make sense if you're gonna build out, you need to build out alternatives or accommodations to keep your ADA folks and your Title VII religious folks whole. I would offer the same kind of program to your pregnant employees who are not yet approved to receive the vaccine. Well, and to your point, Carrie, I mean, that, all that data, you know, such a, a novel, uh, you know, uh, coronavirus is so novel that, that we really don't know the data and the impact to, you know, um, uh, pregnancy. So to your point, making those accommodations as you go forward uh, or the ability to support, you know, uh, that employee is going to be important. Um, Marty, kind of kicking it back over to you when you think about the incentive risk chart. Uh, I know uh, we kind of talked about this over the last week. Um, specific to kind of those incentive programs and the risk chart. Um, and you touched on some of these already, but just wanted to take you through this slide and, and have you speak to uh, kind of the low risk reward and higher risk. 
Sure, and you know, just revisiting uh, our survey results, when we found that you know 60% were either wanting to give an incentive, which was 20% or 40% weren't sure, and then roughly 35% said that they weren't considering it. But when you've got that 60% that either want to or aren't sure, we want to make sure we're talking to employers about well, what does that mean? And so, you know, the easiest thing you can do is educate your employees. There's no risk to educating your employees. There's a huge reward to it. They have the opportunity to be convinced that they should be going to get the vaccine. Uh, you're not offering them anything other than giving them information. Uh, and, and, you know, to, to Travis's point uh, that he mentioned that some of his clients have been doing, educating them in a way they may want to be educated, uh, that they probably don't want to listen to you know, the CEO and CFO of the company tell them why, but they probably want to hear from people from their own demographic, people in the medical field, people at the CDC. Uh, and, and so those are things that are really important to consider. You know, ratcheting up the risk a little bit, uh, low risk, you know, giving somebody time off and understanding that they may need additional time off uh, if they have side effects afterwards. Um, you know, that that probably would fall under what we would understand as de minimis. Um, but again, we're not 100 percent sure on that. So we're, we're going to say it's low risk, but not no risk. Um, you know, the EEOC's guidance that that has existed on incentives previously told us, I think, a $15 gift card or a $10 gift card. Uh, so even two hours uh, of pay is probably more than that. So so we don't know really where that falls. And then ratcheting up the risk a little bit, you know, providing PTO and then the cost. So, you know, something that might be out of pocket more in the $50 range uh, is still, or more than that, uh, depending on, you know, some people are paying for, I saw in that CNN article, uh, people paying for Uber and Lyft rides uh, to go get the shot and then to return home from getting the shot. Um, you know, and certainly there's value on that. And then of course the highest risk being a monetary incentive uh, and something that's higher for those who get the vaccine uh, versus others. And, and so we're always gonna talk about trying to come up with ways to give the incentive to people who get the vaccine and those who choose not to, for whatever reason, uh, an alternative way to get the incentive to lower that risk. Uh, but when we start talking about higher level incentives without EEOC guidance, you are taking on the highest, highest level of risk. And, you know, Marty, I've seen some crazy incentive programs. Um, there's a there's a cannabis retailer up in Michigan who's doing pot for shots. So you bring in your cannabis card and you get a joint. And I thought that was pretty mm -hmm. creative. Um, <laughs> I did read, so I did come across, I was finding all the same data that you were finding on the incentives. And then I stumbled across a hospital in Houston that's actually paying $500 per person. And it was really, it, it, I, I don't know that legal counsel took a look at this because um, the program was purportedly to thank them for performance for the year, but you couldn't get it if you didn't get the vaccine. So substance over form, I think. <laughs> Terry, um, you know, as you're thinking about uh, kind of the incentive chart that we just covered uh, with Marty and moving it more forward to voluntary and educational programs, and um, Travis, I'd love for you to speak to this also. Um, what are we looking at there from an educational program, voluntary, to set up those conversations? Because I think that's also going to be important to take off the mandatory side, but, you know, voluntary where folks are wanting to get it, um, educating, obviously, we talked about the survey, but uh, any thoughts or comments on, on that area? I well, think, go ahead, Travis. I'm sorry, go ahead, Carrie. I, I was just gonna simply say, I think that a voluntary program requires an exercise in restraint. And what I mean by that is employers, managers, HR folks have got to resist the desire to ask why. Why aren't you getting the vaccine? And resist the desire to ask, how was it? Did you have side effects? How do you feel? Do you have any medical complications? Those follow-up questions are a slippery slope. The beauty of voluntary and education programs is, as Marty described and explained, you get to avoid a lot of the complexities. 
So I think so much of this, whatever you guys decide to do in your programming, whatever approach you take, you've got to train your managers. You've got to be sure that the people interfacing with your employees every day know and understand the limits of the kinds of conversations that they can have and know and understand the organization's um, expectations and the frontline person's obligations when it comes to the overall programming and the approach in the programming. And I think that leads right into the health and safety conversation with Travis as well. Travis, you were gonna say something. Yeah, thanks, Kerry. Um, yeah, to Scott's point is that with a voluntary program, it's even more difficult to encourage a lot of the employees to get vaccinated because certainly they don't they don't have to to get to, to keep their jobs. So I think that makes the educational piece that even that more important. Um, and I've seen surveys more in the 17 to 20 percent range of employees that want to get vaccinated. Um, so education is certainly very important when you have a voluntary program. Thank you. Um, so speaking to that, Carrie, um, circling back to you, when you think about the delivery of those type of programs uh, and what that will look and feel like to employers and employees, um, thoughts around that and how that will be a part, whether it's you know, working with a, a vendor or on site with an employer, what are your thoughts on that? Well, like we talked about earlier, it's going to be a long time before a vendor is going to come on site and deliver the vaccine to your employees. Now, you may be a healthcare professional you may be delivering the vaccine to your own employees. And you're gonna to have to navigate that delicate balance between being healthcare provider and employer all at the same time. The privacy rules still apply under ADA. The knowledge that um, you may have of an employee's need for an accommodation is still going to apply. So that gets really tricky when you're healthcare provider and employer at the same time. To Marty's point earlier, the more removed you can be from the program, employee, here's your information, or even here's your incentive, go pick your own vendor, go pick your own provider, go get your vaccine, and bring us back your, your, your COVID vaccine card. As a reminder, the EEOC has said you can ask for proof of the vaccination, and Travis is gonna talk in a little bit about health and safety, and because of some OSHA guidance that's come out, you're gonna need that proof. Um, but the more separate you can be from the person or the entity delivering the vaccine, the less complexity in your life. Marty, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. And I think the, the reality is that if you can find a delicate balance between I want you to I want you to get the vaccine shot, I want you to go get it, but I'm not going to tell you exactly where to go in order to get it. I think that's what's going to be kind of that sweet spot for uh, being able to encourage employees but avoid a lot of the risk factors that we're going to see in, in what I would anticipate will be in the EEOC's new guidance. Thank you, Travis. So, or Marty, so Travis, thinking of what Carrie and Marty kind of touched on, when you think about employers' liability for safety and compliance, specific to probably OSHA um, as kind of the governing body here, uh, thoughts of what that variable will look like in the future uh, from a workplace safety standpoint? Yeah, there's a couple of things here. One, going back to earlier, Marty, Marty had mentioned sort of state laws concerning OSHA issues. And we've already seen four states in the United States, um, Michigan, Oregon, California, and Virginia adopt COVID-19 OSHA standards. Um, and Michigan, well, they all require some sort of written program, but if you look at California and Virginia, they're the most popular ones. Now, I believe that the federal standard, which uh, uh, President Biden has asked OSHA to decide whether or not we need a federal standard by March the 15th. I think the federal standard will look a lot like Virginia. And one of the things that Virginia requires is to have a COVID-19 response plan. So to Carrie's point, I think it's a good idea to put the vaccine program that you have um, in your general health and safety program or in this COVID-19 response plan, which is your COVID-19 health and safety program for all intents and purposes. And that gets it out of the, any sort of wellness program or believing that it is. Now, you're going to have to be required, maybe by March 15th, or most of the folks on the call are going to be required to have a written COVID-19 response plan. So why not go ahead and put that vaccine program within the, this health and safety program? Because at the end of the day, whether or not you have a vaccine is a safety and health issue, right, in the workplace. Um, you can also put in there whether it's mandatory, whether it's uh, 
voluntary. And then with respect to OSHA guidance, they really have two key issues to think about right now is one that employers should offer the vaccine at no charge. It doesn't say mandate it, it just says offer it. And then also the vaccinated workers should be treated the same as unvaccinated workers for purposes of social distancing, wearing masks, things along those lines. So it should be part of your safety program in any event for that reason as well. Great. So um, thinking about obviously those regulatory guidelines that are that are there now, and it sounds like there, there may or may not be some changes as we move forward. Um, do you see uh, COVID-19, at least this pandemic, kind of being lumped in with some of the other kind of OSHA that defines communicable di uh, disease? Or do you think this will just be a kind of a standalone policy as we go forward? And I know that's a tough question on the fly, but I say that because putting out, you know, think about SARS a couple years ago or, you know, other, you know, right. diseases we've had, swine flu, things in the past, they haven't been this uh, impactful. So what maybe does that look like for OSHA's kind of communicable disease if we go forward? Yeah, so what's going to happen is they're going to adopt a temporary emergency standard for COVID-19 that will be in place for about six months unless it's renewed. Um, it may be become a part of a permanent communicable disease uh, standard, as you mentioned, Scott, but it'll start off as a temporary standard just for COVID-19. Um, in, in the meantime, OSHA, before they have a standard, they can continue to enforce OSHA's general duty clause, which is the catch-all uh, part of the OSHA Act, which allows an OSHA to enforce um, situations where you have a recognize, recognized hazard even without an OSHA standard. And the Trump administration said we would enforce the CDC guidance even without a standard on point. They didn't really do that, but under the Biden administration, they have said we're going to start enforcing the CDC guidance. So you could be cited for a COVID issue even before we have that temporary standard in place. Right. And when you think about that, like when it comes to like safety changes of Kind of vaccinated workers and i know we've kind of touched on this throughout the presentation uh but any other regulatory guidelines or uh recommendations and again i know this is a little bit of a call fluid or a moving target right now but anything you could speak to from those other guidance and regulatory agencies yeah well um you know the other things that we've seen you know, obviously you want to look at the cdc um, in addition to any osha guidance and the cdc is going to have more about the safety of your workers than any other agency until we get a, a, a temporary standard from osha and one of the things that the CDC has, has started to roll out for vaccinated workers is whether or not, you know, if you have a, a vaccinated worker that's exposed to another person in the workplace, do they have to be quarantined? And said, as long as it's been two weeks since they've had the second dose and no more than three months before the first dose uh, and they don't have any symptoms, then you don't have to quarantine those individuals who have been vaccinated. Um, however, as OSHA has indicated, uh, your vaccinated workers should still to do, you know, wearing masks, social distancing, avoiding crowds, continue to wash hands, which I'm surprised that we have to put that out there. I mean, we should be washing our hands. Um, I, that's one of the things that shocked me during this pandemic. I saw a stat it was like 21% of people wash their hand after using, hands after using the bathroom. I was just blown away. But good hand washing techniques are crucial before and after any pandemic. But Regardless, OSHA and the CDC says even if you've been vaccinated, you should still be doing that. Of course, we don't know. And, and the reason that OSHA has done that and the CDC has done that is because we don't know how effective the vaccines are. Um, we don't know um, whether or not it's going to reduce transmission or how long it's going to last. So that's sort of the status quo. And hopefully as we go forward, the vaccines will prove to be effective and we can start rolling back some of these measures in the workplace. Absolutely. And a lot of the vaccinations uh, right now are, you know, 95 percent effective or maybe the, the other strains that, you know, keep from kind of spreading. But, you know, there's still that five percent chance. A lot of people think, well, just because I got fully vaccinated, I'm going to be safe and I don't have to worry about it. But uh, again, I think that will also be a little bit of a moving target as we go forward, because, you know, what happens when somebody that has been vaccinated has been exposed and they start having symptoms, you know. So I think there'll be a little bit of a flipboard uh, as we go forward. And again, uh, I uh, I, I'm not sure who said it at the beginning of this, but, uh, you know, OSHA sets, sets the minimum standard. So when you're thinking about employer's liability, it's, it's so much more than that, especially whenever you're teeing up the safety of the workplace. So, um, well, that kind of being said, as we kind of come to the kind of the full round table and I've taken some notes here on, on maybe developing out a survey and the town hall expert, but, uh, we put some things together uh, from a vaccination policy development kind of layout. Uh, Carrie, I'll start with you first on the round table. Any final thoughts, comments, uh, things around you say, hey, this is the one takeaway, two takeaways uh, we want from this round table from your point of view? Well, I think to Travis's point, 
from an OSHA health and safety standpoint, OSHA has received over 4,000 whistleblower complaints in the last 12 months. It's, here I go again, unprecedented. Um, there has not been any year in the last 10 years when OSHA received as many whistleblower complaints as, as it's received in the last 12 month period. And so I think taking your employees seriously, communicating with your employees, not just educating them on the vaccine, but listening to them. I love Travis's idea of putting the rank and file folks on your COVID response team, on your health and safety protocol team. Listen to them. They're out in the front line. They're the ones you know, dealing with that day-to-day -day other coworker interaction, customer, guest, patient interaction. Take their complaints and concerns seriously, investigate violations, and enforce your policies and programs. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Marty, same question to you. Uh, final takeaways, thoughts? I know we actually have some bullets here, but any any final takeaways for, uh, for our group today from your point of view? Yeah, I think uh, I, I probably said it uh, repeatedly, so I should say it again. Educate, 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 educate. You know, that's that's the key takeaway for me. And then the one other thing, and I think this is something we haven't talked about, but it's really important as we start to develop these policies. We've talked a lot about the ADA accommodation process and the potential for needing to accommodate uh, religious or other needs as well. It's a great time to look at those handbook policies that you have and to say, does our handbook policy actually make sense in this context? Um, you know, as you're building out a vaccine policy and you put some sort of accommodation um, language in it, have you, when's the last time you reviewed your ADA accommodation policy and understood what the interactive process requires under your handbook and how well documented does it really need to be? Um, and I think this is just, a, you know, it's a kind of a free chance to do them both at the same time and a really good opportunity to improve documents you already have in place. That's a, that's a really good point. I, I usually tell all of our clients or prospective clients that there's nothing worse than going to the shelf or to the electronic file and you pull it off and you see a revision, uh, especially if you're dealing with something and it's from four or five years ago or two years ago. So uh, having current plans and making sure they're updated with the right information and especially from a regulatory standpoint, it's going to be key as we go forward. Um, Travis, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the final say, uh, you know, on your point of view and, and thoughts around, again, not just employee safety and employer liability and workplace safety, but um, thoughts on kind of your final takeaways for, for our attendees today. Yeah, well, I appreciate it, Scott. First thing is I would encourage everybody on the call to go ahead and do a written COVID-19 response plan. If you're not in one of those states I mentioned, it's coming. It's going to be required from us, everybody on the call. Two, to Marty and Carrie, you got you to educate. You've got to communicate you got to listen to your employees okay in addition to having the rank and file folks on those uh, committees um, you know other things like just you know listening to every single uh, problem that they raise um, encouraging them to bring any concerns to your attention uh, responding to that um, those are all uh, very crucial um, I can't tell you how much I've um, I've seen uh, employers be very successful just because they let employees voice their concerns and they reacted to it. And the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, as Marty alluded, you know, this is not something that we've been through before. It's a pandemic, really haven't been around a situation like this since 1918. Not many of us were back then uh, dealing with a pandemic. It's kind of like flying an airplane while we're building at the same time. But I'll tell everybody on the call that in addition to whatever the law is, and sometimes there's a law on point, sometimes there's not, you should always consider the two, these two guideposts when you're making any decisions during a pandemic is one, how is it going to impact employee relations? If I do this to someone, are they going to get mad? Are their coworkers going to get mad? No matter what the law says, it could be legal and it could be very bad for employee morale. And then the second thing is, how is it going to uh, impact the public perception? So you could do something that's perfectly legal but you could look like the worst employer in the world on social media. And so you have to keep that in mind as well. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and you, you touched on a couple of things there. So I, I, I get all the time. Do you have sample programs or you know sample kind of policy and procedures? Uh, highly recommend visiting kind of Hubs uh, Resource Center. We have one set up not just for kind of our vaccination kind of program series that was rolled out over the last 45 days, but we also have our COVID-19 Resource Center. Uh, I tell all of our clients, uh, try to stay away from going onto the internet and downloading kind of sample programs that you just find that somebody uploaded. 
Uh, at the same time, you have to remember state by state may vary. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're staying current. So as you're trying to develop out that information, especially from a, a program, um, you know, boilerplate blueprint program for your, uh, for your operations, you want to make sure that it's tailored and customized. Uh, the worst thing you can do is go on and grab a, a template online or get something from a friend and try to make it your own. So really work with your broker, uh, work with Hub in order to develop that out or uh, a firm uh, like Fisher Phillips that obviously has a, a depth of uh, not just education and knowledge, but uh, partnership with us. So thank you all so much today. Um, I, I go back to uh, Marty Travis. Uh, here's their contact information at Fisher Phillips. Uh, feel free to reach out to them. Uh, I did put their office number on here instead of their cell phone number so they don't get calls at 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, but thank you both uh, for the time today. And uh, Carrie, as always, you know, thank you for your insight and help and support to make sure uh, this vaccination program uh, in series from Hub was a success. So thank you. All right, thank you. Well, thank you all for yeah, thank you all for joining us today. I really do. I really appreciate it. Um, we hope that the information that you all have found, uh, not just within this this series uh, for vaccination, but our entire COVID nineteen resource library, uh, is beneficial. Thank you to the marketing team for putting this on, uh, Hub International and our Hubber Services uh, Division uh, for their support to be able to put all this collateral and resources together. And have a great day. This concludes our webinar.